today's topic is manufacturing of electronics. And uh, what uh, we're doing today is, uh, you know, I had you prepare by reading some materials, answering some questions online. I'm going to do a, a pretty much traditional lecture for most of the three hours. So uh, there's no challenge today. Uh, we'll record your attendance later on in the, in the time. I don't mean this is a surprise. I, I see happiness. That's good. Uh, but, but, uh, uh, but, but the idea, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, hap I'm happy too. The, I'm the, the idea is that I feel this is a topic that is best addressed by me uh, uh, explaining it and us asking questions. Uh, and uh, we have this second Seek and Geek assignment uh, on the docket. And uh, uh, that is essentially a homework related to electronics. So, uh, uh, you know, I do this because I think this is a really important topic for us all to learn and discuss. I know it's a busy time in the semester and like the feeling of, you know, uh, oh darn another assignment isn't the greatest feeling, but I'm hopeful that you'll be able to uh, get what you need to do this efficiently uh, uh, on your own by next Monday when it's due by uh, uh, listening uh, and learning today. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, that's, that, that, that's the approach. And then class next week, uh, we have a few guest speakers uh, and no prep work. Uh, we'll probably have a short in-class reflection, uh, uh, kind of taking the, the, the place of the, the challenge grade. Uh, and uh, we're going to focus on uh, sourcing and scale up. Uh, basically, once you've designed your part for manufacturing, we'll hear from uh, experts with experience in taking the last mile to actually uh, go and get it made by contract manufacturers here or other places in the world. And I hope that provides a nice capstone to uh, the journey from the definition of manufacturing to a full reflection on how manufacturing gets done. So why do I choose to uh, spend you know, this day on manufacturing of electronics, well, uh, it's because so many things that we use and so many products uh, that are designed today have electronic functionality, right? And uh, while we are uh, mechanical engineers and, and, and probably uh, few, if any of you, are electrical engineers, I think we have to uh, appreciate and understand how electronic devices are integrated in manufacturing processes. And with that, a little bit about the manufacturing processes that are used to make electronics from the smallest scale to the final finished system, uh, you know, circuit board, display, uh, something like that. Uh, and uh, you know, we have, uh, for instance, uh, spoken many times about, you know, smartphones, tablets, our friend the $50 or like $30 on uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Amazon Fire tablet. And, you know, this is, while it's a low cost, low performing tablet device, it's incredibly impressive the number of materials and processes and suppliers uh, uh, involved in making this happen. Right, basically from uh, the full finished device to, you know, the finest transistors and capacitors and resistors on the circuit board. Each step in every process involves the same level of understanding and sophistication that you might apply to, you know, machining something or injection molding of something. And I feel that in a way electronic devices are an expression of this, this massive uh, combination of value and scale uh, in creating, uh, you know, integrated sophisticated things. Uh, and, you know, if I take it apart and I look at the circuit board assembly, uh, which uh, is one piece and, you know, basically is a circuit board and contains a bunch of components, the kinds of components we'll talk about as the afternoon goes on, you know, here under a metal shield. Uh, and I tear open that metal shield and, uh, and open it up, I find, you know, what is basically more circuit board. But I find different kinds of chips, basically, uh, you know, pieces of, uh, uh, of, of electronics with different functionality on them attached to the circuit board. Uh, and for example, this is the CPU of the first generation one. That's the flash memory. It had eight gigs of memory when they took this one apart. And then these are all the power electronics, basically resistors and capacitors that do, you know, switching of power and signals between these chips and, uh, and to the display. Uh, and, you know, each of these components is made separately and then all of those components are purchased and 
assembled onto the circuit board and the circuit board is assembled and wired together into the finished device. Uh, and if I take, you know, a cross section of the, uh, the device, this is, uh, I believe, exactly, exactly this one here, right? We took the battery out and we put the, put the tablet on the water jet and cut it apart. Uh, uh, you basically see at the top here, not, not in the picture on the left, it's off, off panel, the stacked layers of the display, which we'll talk about later. And here you have a uh, cut through the uh, circuit board uh, and the metal shield over the circuit board. And this is, uh, for instance, one of the processor or communication chips. This is a piece of a silicon wafer which has really, really fine transistors on it, basically sitting on metal spheres that are used to send the signals in and out and into the circuit board that has the, all, the, all the other electronic elements in it. Uh, and this is to me kind of like a, like a journey of length scales because we're going to talk at the start about like, how we make the finest features in electronic devices, basic principles of microfabrication, semiconductor processing. And then we're going to jump up to bigger and bigger length scales and talk about how the uh, electronics are assembled to make circuit boards and functional systems. And we'll touch a bit on displays and we'll touch a bit on flexible stuff and hopefully have more than you did at the start a perspective on how this all fits together and how, you know, some principles of how electronics are integrated in products. Uh, and, you know, one really cool process that uh, we'll get to later on is what's called pick and place assembly, right? So, uh, you, you, you know, you may wonder uh, if I look even at this circuit board, which is a really old one from a big desktop computer, but same idea, how all the little components get on circuit boards. It's not that there's people doing them manually, it's that there's really, really fast gantry robots called pick and place machines that pick up from cartridges or tapes all the individual components and put them on the circuit boards in exactly the right place. And this is a real-time video of a, of, a, uh, of a commercial pick and place machine. And what it's doing is it's assembling components onto circuit boards from these tapes with this very fast moving gripper head. Uh, and it can do uh, many thousands of components per hour. I think the highest performance ones I've found online do this at 20,000 components an hour. So this is enabled by uh, automation and that's what lets, in addition to the components, lets the, you know, the circuit board technology be so inexpensive and let it, uh, uh, you know, circuit boards be designed for, 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 for different functionalities. Uh, and, you know, I'm not just talking about smartphones and tablets, uh, talking about many other things. Has anyone ever opened up an LED light bulb? A few of you. What do you find inside if you do it? Yeah, yeah, so it's basically like a, it's maybe no surprise, but right, old light bulbs are like this one, right? Electricity filament glows, dissipates heat. Uh, new light bulbs are basically electronic devices encased in plastic. At the base, where you have the, you know, screw fitting, same interface, I've taken it off. You have a whole bunch of power electronics that basically manipulate the power that's used to power the LEDs. And instead of a filament, you have little semiconductor LEDs. Uh, and this relates to one question you have on the, on the assignment. Basically tell us from what we discussed today uh, how uh, this, uh, a device like this, a light bulb like this is put together. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's pretty cool that, you know, light bulbs have gone from completely analog to basically uh, uh, be electronic devices. Uh, and uh, I will pass around, in, in the assignment you'll see some pictures. Uh, uh, we bought a few of these light bulbs. We didn't, we didn't think you needed one, one for each of you. Uh, but I'll pass around, maybe Adam can you give me a hand? Uh, uh, four of these and you can just take a quick look, right? Just, you know, so you have a visual sense for yourselves, what the circuit board looks like, what we're talking about. And notice the different types and sizes of components and, you know, get a sense of how they're anchored down and whether they're on the surface or whether they're poking through, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, and, and, and so, yeah, so the idea of assembling electronics and, 
regular products is, is kind of everywhere, right? Apple is among the best. This is, this is the pen. Does anyone have an iPad with one of these pens or a Microsoft Surface with a tablet, right? If you take, take open the pen, it's you know, basically a cylinder of electronics with battery and you know, circuit boards. And here is two circuit boards stacked close, stacked together, right? You can see if I focus in like right there with all the small components on it, uh, pretty amazing. Or uh, I got, there's a, there's a, there's a, a startup uh, uh, that's now shipping product called Motive from the Bay Area. It's not focusing well on my hand, but uh, this is a smart ring. This costs $200. Uh, uh, this has uh, in it uh, a heart rate sensor, uh, a processor, a curved battery, memory, and wireless communication to sync to your phone. And it like looks and feels like a ring. So things are getting ever, ever smaller. And if you have like an average activity level, maybe exercise 30 minutes a day, uh, it lasts, the battery lasts for three days. So people really understand how everything fits together. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, we could probably make a really interesting, you know, assignment uh, on how these are made. I asked Dave and Joe to, I got, got two of them, so we could, we could uh, take one apart. Uh, they tried and, and basically concluded it's impossible to disassemble without excessive destruction. Uh, uh, <laughs> but what we find is the electronics are all laid in a ring shape and then the plastic inner is over molded around that while the electronics are basically held in what looks like an epoxy here. And then the outer surface of the ring, which is either this like rose gold color or is the darker color I, I'm wearing, uh, is sheet metal. Sheet metal that's crimped around the side and is probably anodized and coated. So like, you know, th this is a really like beautiful piece of, of, of electronics and materials and, you know, they, they got to figure it out to make it happen. Uh, and uh, you can there see like examples of how you can embed electronics in plastics if you make a circuit board and you mold around it or how you know uh, you can make thin sheet metal and form it into a ring and made it with these different kinds of materials and that's what happens all around as uh, as as electronics are integrated in products uh, or for instance this is a little uh, a drone this was part of the quiz last year uh, and uh, we did the same water jet thing and you know cut it apart and, and you see the circuit board uh, sitting basically forming part of the structure of the little quadcopter here. And then wiring connecting the circuit board uh, to the motors and the battery fits I believe in this, this empty cavity space here. Uh, and you know more and more uh, industry wants to combine functions. They want stuff that is looks better you know, lighter weight, has battery built in, has electronics, has communication, and all of these things are kind of getting smaller and smaller together. Uh, and then, you know, one last example before I go to uh, the, the, the approach we're going to take. Uh, you all know Tesla, and some of you might be fans of, 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 of Tesla and what they talk about and what they are promising to do. Uh, you know, they're also getting into uh, the energy loop beyond uh, electric vehicles. Uh, and uh, I believe you can now uh, purchase from them, uh, albeit expensive, like solar roof tiles. And so, you know, traditional solar panels, you know, they work. Uh, they're getting cheaper and cheaper, but they're kind of, you know, uh, some people think they're, you know, big and ugly to have on the roof of your house. Well, what Tesla and a, a company they bought called... Uh, 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 first Solar, I believe, uh, uh, have done is they've made roof shingles that are essentially solar panels. And each of these is a photovoltaic device. It's, it's kind of like a display on your phone or a laptop, but is, has materials that you know, convert sunlight into electricity. Uh, and they're able to make these in mass and they're able to basically print on them such that if you look from the street, it looks like a, you know, a roof of regular aesthetic. Uh, but if you're looking from the top, uh, it basically looks like transparent glass and a photovoltaic and, and the sun's rays are able to penetrate. Uh, and so therein, I'm sure, is a lot of interesting manufacturing process development. You know, how do you print on the glass? How do you wire all the solar cells together, uh, et cetera, et cetera? 
probably not cheap enough for the mass market, but another example of interesting integration of, you know, manufacturing advanced materials and, and essentially electronics. All right. So what do I want to do uh, in uh, maybe the next two hours and a, and a bit? Uh, is try to take us on a journey uh, through a few key manufacturing technologies for electronic products. And we're going to start with what we call integrated circuit processing, uh, techniques by which you uh, make the finest scale of electronic devices, the transistors and et cetera, that uh, do computation in computers uh, uh, via different unit processes, basically manipulating uh, depositing and patterning thin films. And then we're going to talk about uh, how circuit boards are manufactured, soldered, assembled, uh, which basically hold the integrated circuits, the really sophisticated chips that contain all the intelligence, and wire them together to create functional systems. Uh, we'll focus on pick and place assembly with that. Uh, we'll talk about how circuit boards are connected together, right? How you connect. Uh, you know, circuit boards via rigid and flexible connections. And then we'll talk a little bit, probably in the last few minutes, about some emerging technologies, really cool ways that we can think about uh, printing electronic materials or integrating circuit boards, for example, with thermal forming. Uh, and, you know, in front of you, uh, you have a, a pretty thick stack of slides. Uh, we'll, of course, post all of this online and, and we'll also make, the, make the, the, the video that we're capturing available. Uh, I'm certainly going to... Uh, jump over some things and try to try to try to hit on the key points uh, but please you know offer comments quest questions throughout I'd love to keep this interactive because it'll be a, a pretty lengthy session uh, and I want to want to keep all of our all of our attention okay so so you know first things first what do I mean by an integrated circuit well if I look at uh, you know one of the large black boxes on this old circuit board or on the, you know, Amazon Fire circuit board. Uh, you know, it's basically a piece of rectangular plastic with a whole bunch of pins. Those pins uh, or, you know, metal, shorter metal legs uh, is what connects it to the circuit board. If I cut that open inside, like you saw in the cross section, I see a little piece of uh, what is a silicon wafer, a very thin, uh, polished substrate upon which all the electronics are built. These are like 8-inch silicon wafers. Industry now uses 12 or 16-inch silicon wafers, basically the size of pizzas. Uh, and uh, uh, the wires here, the legs that connect to the circuit board, go through the plastic and basically are connected to the silicon via fine wires. That's called wire bonding. Typically the wires are gold uh, because you want the uh, electrical conductivity and stability to be the highest. And then if I take this, this silicon chip, right, and you can see texture on this, right, this has had some processing to make circuits, uh, and I look more closely, right, I see something that essentially looks like, uh, you know, urban area from, from an airplane or, you know, earth from space with a clear s sky. And if I cut a cross section through it, I see many layers of different grayscale colors here, meaning different materials. And, you know, basically each silicon wafer is like this 50 or 100 floor, like parking garage network of different materials conducting materials, metals, dielectric, semiconductors that is architected to be able to send electrons in different directions and do computation and data storage and so on. And like the complexity of these devices is really, really uh, amazing. Uh, yet the most basic building block is what's called a transistor. Uh, and the transistor, the invention of the transistor uh, over 50 years ago, I think in, in the 1950s, as we'll see in a minute, was uh, uh, basically the foundation of the semiconductor industry and led to our ability to do computational electronics as we do today. And what a transistor is, is it's basically a combination of materials in solid state that allows us to switch the transport of electrons. So it's basically a valve for 
electrons and lets us send current or stop current from going in a particular direction. Uh, and uh, therefore, the building block of modern uh, transistor electronics is what's called the MOSFET transistor. Uh, this basically stands for metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. The metal oxide semiconductor is because this contains metals and oxides and semiconductors. And field effect transistor basically means that uh, uh, it switches an electrical signal by applying a field to a semiconductor. And if you apply a field to a semiconductor, you can add or withdraw charge from it, and therefore you can change its effective conductivity. So, you know, we don't need to understand the physics of how trans transistors work, but I just want you to appreciate that this basic element, right, uh, called a, called a, 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 a transistor, uh, basically uh, by applying what's known as a, called a gate voltage to the semiconductor through this oxide, uh, allows you to uh, uh, manipulate the conductivity of a semiconductor in this direction. And if I apply a certain voltage uh, on the gate, I can turn and turn off the transmission of current uh, uh, through the plane of the wafer. And if each of these represents a few layers inside my really, really tall parking garage of, uh, of, of, of different materials, uh, I can make you know, uh, billions uh, upon billions of these in a single chip. And that's basically what lets all of our devices do what they can do, is these and other elements that allow us to switch electrons uh, and, and, their, and their motion and do computation by uh, switching uh, uh, at very, very, very high speeds. And the transistor was invented at Bell Labs in the 1950s, uh, uh, actually 1948. Uh, the first transistor was made in 1947, uh, and uh, these guys, uh, Bardeen, Shockley, and Bretain, were like the founders of the semiconductor industry. They were working at Bell Labs, which was uh, a basic research lab, and they were trying to understand how to use new materials to enable solid state computation. And their first transistor, had the same kind of physical architecture as I showed you on a slide ago, except it was really big. They basically took blocks of materials and smashed them together, but they had a, a metal and a semiconductor and a dielectric, and they were able to show this principle of switching. Uh, and you know, they got the Nobel Prize for this. There's a really, really great book called The Idea Factory, if you like the history of science and innovation and tells the story of this and a lot of other really cool uh, 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 things at that time. Also has a very strong connection to, to MIT because a lot of the uh, pioneering folks at Bell Labs were uh, uh, MIT grads and there was very close collaboration between the two. Uh, and then what happened is uh, subsequent people, Bell Labs and others, figured out how to take this like crude prototype device and put it into a planar format, and over time, we developed what we call photolithography and etching and thin film deposition technologies to basically pattern materials in plane so I can basically stack images, very fine images of different materials together, and I can make uh, uh, these very, very sophisticated device patterns. And over time, the number of transistors, number of elements I can fit on this wafer has gotten higher and higher and higher and higher uh, because all the driving technologies have gotten better. This industry is so important to the advancement of right, society that a lot of smart people uh, 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 solve really hard problems and a lot of money is spent. And that's enabled you know, electronic devices and computation to get you know, cheaper and faster and is still, still getting there. Like uh, if you uh, hear about something known as Moore's Law, which is captured on the slides, right? Moore, uh, Gordon Moore was one of the founders of Intel, Intel uh, that we know today. Uh, and uh, decades ago, he said, I think that every uh, year, 
the number of transistors per unit area is going to double, something like that. And he made this prediction, and it's basically been true and still persists because we're figuring out how to make these transistors smaller and smaller in ways that I will tell you. Uh, and you know, this stops in 2011, uh, but uh, suffice to say that the basically smallest feature that you can make via the processes we'll discuss continues to get small, smaller, uh, and we're coming up with new creative ways to create three-dimensional structures or use nanomaterials, things like carbon nanotubes, if you've heard of those, as transistors to be smaller and smaller. There will be some limit, but electronics are going to get, you know, uh, processors are going to get, uh, you know, uh, 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 smaller and lower power consuming, uh, and, and that's still happening. So that's my sort of motivation for semiconductor manufacturing for making really small devices. Now we'll talk about how this stuff is made. Uh, so in order to do this, right, uh, to make processors, you need a really, really big factory with a lot of uh, equipment and uh, a lot of requirements uh, be, to be met. So uh, we will uh, uh, watch here a few minute video and hopefully the, I might need to come out of this and, and get the sound on, sorry. Basically a walkthrough of a semiconductor manufacturing plant. Let's try this. Looks like, and I want you to tell me at the end some of the things you notice. Like, how is this different than a factory that, you know, would would produce, you know, uh, yo-yos or toys or pipe fittings or something like that. Before entering the clean room, personnel must wear clean room garments, suits, gloves, and face masks to ensure cleanliness. After changing clothes, personnel enter the air wash room to completely remove dust and particles from their bodies, preventing suspended particles from entering the fab. An integrated circuit, or IC, is a system of electronic components and circuits miniaturized onto a silicon chip one centimeter square or smaller. An integrated circuit can process a large number of electronic signals and perform many complex functions. If we look at a chip under a microscope, we can see that the apparently smooth surface is actually stacked with many components of different heights and shapes. How are these components fabricated? Let's start with the raw materials used to make the IC. Silicon wafers are a type of semiconductor material and the basic raw materials used in the manufacturing of ICs. By building the wafer with elements such as arsenic, phosphorus, and boron, the conductivity and characteristics of the wafer are changed. To make silicon wafers that meet the requirements for flatness and uniformity needed to make ICs, raw polycrystalline silicon material is first heated to a high temperature. By adjusting speed and temperature, a cylindrical ingot of crystalline silicon is pulled out. The outer surface of the silicon ingot is then ground to a uniform diameter and sliced into thin silicon wafers. 
The edge and surface of the silicon wafers are ground and polished. We can now use this silicon wafer to begin manufacturing integrated circuits. IC design engineers first use computer-aided design systems to lay out the patterns for each circuit of the IC. By using electron beams or lasers, these patterns are then transferred to photomats. The number of photomats required for an integrated circuit product usually depends on the complexity of the design and the process technologies. Generally, it requires at least 20 to 30 layers of photomats, and the alignment between each layer must be very accurate. The fab for manufacturing IC is divided into several major areas. Each area has a unique function. In the decrishing area, the silicon wafers are sent into an oven sheet for thin film growth at high temperature. The silicon wafer stays in this environment where temperature and gas flow rate are accurately controlled for a period of time, and the surface reacts with the high temperatures and forms an insulating silicon compound film. Ion implantation is a process used to implant charged ions into a specific region of the silicon wafer. Conductivity is changed by controlling the concentration and depth of the ion. In the chemical vapor deposition, CVD area, chemical reactions occur in the reaction chamber, and the reactive chemical vapors form a solid state reactant, which is deposited on the chip surface as a thin film. The wafer is now covered in a thin film and sent to the photolithography area for transfer of circuit patterns. A thin layer of photo resist, a photosensitive liquid, is uniformly coated on the wafer surface. The photomass is then placed over the wafer. Light is exposed onto the wafer through the photomass, creating a pattern of exposed and unexposed areas based on the pattern of the photomat. Unexposed areas remain covered with photoresist. After photolithography processing, the silicon wafer will be sent into the etching area to etch out the exposed region, that is, the regions uncovered by the photoresist. The remaining pattern is the area needed for the circuit. Once the wafer surface is covered with several thousand to several million electronic components, the components are connected with metal conducting wires so that they can perform their designated function. Here, the surface etched wafer is further coated with a thin layer of metal film, processed with photolithography, and etched to remove the unnecessary parts and leave the metal wires connecting each electronic element. The chemical mechanical polishing area uses mechanical principles and chemical reactants to effectively remove materials on the silicon wafer and make it flat in preparation for later thin film deposition. These complicated and precise processes are repeatedly performed in the fab to complete the manufacture of IC. Each. Let's talk to the workers on the ring to know. May have seen before. Yes. <clears throat> yep, humidity, temperature, air quality, that's why I call it a clean room because you need everything to basically be dust free and, and you know, when we think about precision of alignment uh, and assembly we're talking about nanometers and things have to be also very thermally stable. Something else, yes? The people don't touch the wafers. The people don't touch the wafers, yeah, it's like uh, isolation between the material and the humans. The humans who are in the clean room are uh, basically there when something needs to be fixed or something needs to be checked upon. Anything else? Yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So do you know what the yellow lighting is for? Yeah, so not to mess with the photoresist. Like analogy to the Form Labs a stereolithography printer having an orange hood, right? Uh, if we had white light, then the polymers that are photosensitive uh, would, uh, would, would be affected by the light and, and you'd screw up the quality of your process. Uh, and also, uh, there's a lot of automation, right? It's not like big robots uh, moving things in six degrees of freedom, but because the people don't touch the wafers, there's a uh, basically an overhead rail system 
that carries cartridges of wafers from machine to machine. And interestingly, Professor Alex Slocum uh, originally designed the standard interface using what's called the kinematic coupling for all the wafer pods that end up now used in semiconductor fabrication. Because the robots that run overhead need to pick up and drop off the boxes of wafers easily. And, and many years ago, he worked with the semiconductor industry to develop that standard interface that I believe is, is still used to today. So yeah, so obviously a lot of differences from uh, large uh, manufacturing. And as a result, right, I have a slide in front of you with a, a bunch of statistics, right? These facilities are extremely expensive. They're multi-billion dollar facilities. As a result, now there's only a few uh, large manufacturers in the world that have these clean rooms. TSMC, uh, you don't see like Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing on your phone because they make uh, uh, electronics for other companies that make electronic devices. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, Samsung has fabs. I think Samsung was on the picture a slide ago. Uh, Intel has fabs and so on and so forth. Uh, and they're, you know, extremely energy intensive because it costs a lot of energy to keep that temperature controlled, keep that humidity controlled, and keep the dust out. Uh, and also the equipment inside these uh, uh, factories is very, very expensive. Uh, you know, even though it's, you know, doing Right, simple things, it's not crazy multi-axis machining. The level of control needed in uh, heating surfaces, in controlling the flow of gases, in uh, doing uh, uh, deposition things, reactions that we'll talk about is very, very high. Uh, and that makes the equipment quite expensive. So these are big, big investments. Uh, but basically what happens is uh, a company uh, uh, builds a new factory, a new fab, and they're able to keep it alive for many, many years, use it for many years, uh, and uh, are able to use it at the outset for manufacturing like the most cutting edge processors. Uh, and then as new technology comes into play, they're able to upgrade the machines or they're able to focus the fab on manufacturing not quite the latest generation, but things that are still valuable, right? So like, you know, your, 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 your phone has probably the, you know, uh, latest generation of, uh, uh, you know, a uh, fast, low power processor that makes it do what it does, but, you know, uh, uh, other devices, right, that can be electronic, don't necessarily need that level. So the uh, bit outdated uh, technology is still used to make things that are valuable, but don't need to be on that cutting edge of performance. Uh, and if I look at the like layout of the, of the factory, I stopped the video a bit early on purpose, uh, uh, you have uh, basically two sides, what we call the front end and the back end. Uh, this is not the best schematic, but you know what happens is, uh, the uh, uh, clean room receives blank silicon wafers that are grown as single crystals and cut up. And then it takes the wafers through all the sequential processes that deposit and etch uh, and, and, and polish the surface, right? That basically multi-layer image printing at a very fine scale. That's what's called the front end. That's basically where the devices get built. At the end of the front end, you have a full wafer with everything patterned on it. And then the wafers get sent into the back end, and in the back end, as it's named, uh, the wafers get cut up into pieces, which end up being the individual devices, and the devices get packaged and tested, and then you basically ship out processors and you know, accelerometers and, uh, and communication chips and things like that. And the reason why these are separated is like, this is really clean, and this is not so clean, because once I start cutting things apart, I generate dust and, and so on. So I have to encapsulate and seal all the electronics here before I cut it apart and assemble it. Uh, and, and, and then what comes out is basically a, a chip that's ready to be mounted on a circuit board. Uh, and you know, probably in terms of like volume of factory to volume of product, this is the highest like ratio in the world. I actually, two, two days before the quiz in November, I had the opportunity to tour uh, Boeing's factory in, in uh, near Seattle. Has anyone ever been to the Boeing factory? Cool. So that was an awesome, awesome experience. I couldn't take any pictures, but you can find lots of pictures online. And there would be the opposite. Their factory is like the, actually they say it's the biggest building in the world, and you know they make big airplanes. So there the product is big relative to the building. Uh, it was really interesting to see like how they assemble planes and uh, the big differences between like planes made out of composites, for example, the 787, and planes you know that are made more out of you know uh, metal structures uh, and the architecture and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, 
I'm sure you can re read, about, read about that online if you're interested. Uh, so, you know, these clean rooms are big things, but MIT also has a clean room. Some of you have heard of MIT Nano. It's the new research, materials research facility that's being built. It's like right next to Building 13 uh, in the back end of campus. Uh, this is what it'll look like when it opens up next, uh, uh, next year. And, you know, uh, there are many uh, faculty and graduate students who do research on microelectronics and nanomaterials, and they use similar techniques as this to basically try to understand how to make the materials that will make circuits, you know, uh, better and, and, and higher performing. We're not making sophisticated microprocessors because we couldn't do that here. It would be too complicated, but we're experimenting with new techniques. And for MIT as a research institute, this is going to be a really, really, uh, really big thing. So uh, in the next set of slides that follow, uh, I uh, provide information to take you through an example process flow. So basically what was said in the video uh, was any process that makes these complex multi-layer electronics involves a uh, decided sequence of operations of material addition and material removal with some characterization and with pattern transfer to be able to pattern the material. So if I start out with a blank wafer and I want to create lines on it, right, lines of metal or lines of semiconductor depending on what my device architecture is, I first put down a uniform layer of that material and then I use photolithography, for example, to pattern it. Uh, and then I etch away the material I don't want and then I repeat with the next material. And so any process flow is basically a combination of these steps and uh, if we uh, understand some basics about the different steps and how they work together we can design basic processes for making certain devices right? and that's one of the things I, I ask you to do on, on, the, on the assignment is to kind of extrapolate this kind of process to the thin film transistors that are not made on wafers but are actually made on glass and that's what drives the pixels in a color display and you can take this uh, methodology and you can use it to uh, tell us what the process flow would be to make a, a device like this which is a idealization of a uh, of a transistor that's used to control the uh, switching of uh, the color pixels on a, a simple color display. So it's a process flow, it's a sequence, and the quality of each of these steps has to be, has to be, uh, uh, be maintained. So I will try to walk us through uh, quickly a simple example. Basically the, the example is I want to make this, how do I make it? I start out with a blank silicon wafer, I want to have a thin layer of dielectric silicon dioxide to uh, have some insulation between the wafer. Uh, and what I put on top, and on top I want to put a, a row of metal lines. Say it's an element of even building a single layer of transistors. So how would I do this? Well, I would design a process flow of deposition and patterning steps to go from my starting condition, which is my blank silicon wafer, uh, up here with a smooth <coughs> polished surface. Right, the surface has to be really smooth, mirror smooth, nanometer smooth in order to be able to get very uniform thin films all the way down to my finished product. And, you know, why you saw so many machines and so many stations in that clean room is, you know, each of these wafers, if you want to have so many, many layers, right, dozens of layers, is visiting many machines depositing and etching many, many different materials. And you'll probably have multiple machines for each material, and each machine is probably going to only deal with one uh, uh, type of material because you don't want to contaminate with, you know, having it deposit first material A and next material B because all the gases and liquids have to be very pure. But basically what I do first is I take my silicon wafer and I deposit a thin film of that oxide, that dielectric, uh, and I can actually deposit it basically expose it to a gas that, uh, that, that deposits oxide on the surface, or I can uh, uh, do what's called grow oxide, which basically means take this silicon surface and react it with oxygen so the top layer of the silicon converts into, into SiO2. Then, because the silicon dioxide layer is not patterned, I can just go next and I can deposit a layer of metal 
and I can deposit metal films using vapor of metal, what's called physical vapor deposition. And then in order to pattern the metal layer, I do a photolithography process, which basically involves first coating the substrate with my metal and oxide with photoresist, a thin photoreactive polymer. Patterning it, I pattern it by exposing it to pattern light through a mask, through basically a piece of glass. And I forgot the mask I have in my office, but imagine a piece of window glass with a fine pattern on it. Uh, and I'm basically able to cure the photoresist in certain areas and wash the excess away. And then I use the photoresist as a mask to etch the metal. So if I have the photoresist here, and then I expose all of this to a gas or a liquid that'll eat the metal away, where the gas or the liquid is chosen so it reacts with the metal but not with the, with the, with the photoresist, because I have the photoresist here in some places, the metal will only be etched away where it's open to be accessed by the etchant. And then I have this structure, and then I basically put it in another liquid to dissolve away the photoresist and leave my final step. So this sequence of operations is a basically a single, what you would say is a single iteration of thin film deposition and patterning. So what, I wanna, what do I want to talk a little bit more about? Well, I want to highlight, yes? Um, so can you go back to the last one? Yes. Uh, so you're saying, for example, take, this is the wafer, this is the oxide, you're saying like put photoresist first? Yeah. Okay, so put photoresist first and then put metal down like this. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So, so in principle, you could. Uh, you could, for example. So, if this is the metal, and then this is the photoresist, I could say, well, I do this. I come in and I polish off the top surface, and then I dissolve away the photoresist. In that case, I'd basically have like metal, like this. Yes, it could work, but it would be a little bit rough. So you wouldn't have the precision you have if you do it this way. And it would probably involve more steps. Another thing you could do is what's called like uh, lift off in a way I could, I might be able to get a, get a chemical in here and dissolve the resist and just pull the metal off right here if this is thin. But I wouldn't, ha wouldn't have the same precision as I would in this case. Good question. Anyone else? All right. So. I, I will not go through every step because you have the slides and I think you, you, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to follow, follow along as you need. But I'll, I'll highlight a couple, of the, a couple of the type of processes, right? The first one is thin film deposition. How do we get different thin films down on substrates? And this is actually much more relevant than semiconductor manufacturing. The fact that these d techniques for depositing thin films of oxides, metals, semiconductors were developed for wafer fabs also let them be used, for example, in coating window glass and coating razor blades. Like when we had the quiz question about the thin coatings on the razor blades, they're actually put down by these similar things. And also like coating uh, uh, milling tools, milling and turning tools, as we talked about on the you know, first week of class. It's all done by these different ways. So how can I deposit a thin film of material on a wafer? Uh, well, I typically want the film to be extremely thin, nanometers or tens of nanometers and very, very smooth. So as I said a moment ago, one way to do it is for certain materials I can react the surface. So if I have a bare silicon wafer that's clean, basically no oxide on the surface, pure silicon, if I expose it to oxygen at high temperature, I actually will convert some of the silicon to silicon dioxide. So I consume a little bit of the silicon on the surface and then I 
uh, grow some additional material because SiO2 has a, you know, a bigger uh, size uh, than, 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 than silicon at the atomic scale. And this is in fact how very, very thin layers of oxide needed to make high performance transistors are made. So basically if I want to switch that transistor, I want to have a very, very thin dielectric between the gate electrode that applies the voltage and the semiconductor where I, I draw the charge in and out. And this process of oxidation lets us create very, very thin layers of oxide. Uh, and here's an example from a real transistor. This is an atomic resolution microscope picture taken using a special microscope where that thin oxide layer is like four rows of atoms thick. And companies that make this equipment can actually basically go down to single atomic layer precision over wafer areas that are 12 inches. And this is because they know how to control the rate of these deposition and reaction processes extremely well. They're very slow on a macro scale, and also because they have equipment that makes the temperature in the gas flow incredibly uniform, because all of these reactions depend on temperature. So like a, a, a machine that, that, that does, you know, say, uh, uh, oxide deposition on a silicon wafer uh, that's 12 inches wide will basically have a, a matrix of infrared heaters that is basically controlled at the same resolution as a big you know, TV would be controlled. Uh, and they can monitor with infrared cameras and control very, very precisely and uniformly the temperature of the surface. So there's surface oxidation, there's physical vapor deposition. Physical vapor deposition basically means I take a, a, a source material, say I have my, my wafer substrate inside a vacuum chamber, I take a source material, uh, uh, you know, say it's uh, copper, uh, metal. I heat that copper metal up till it's melted and some evaporation occurs. And I have my wafer over here or up above and the wafer is kept cooler and literally the atoms of the metal vapor condense onto my wafer. And if I do that carefully under the right conditions, I can deposit a film of what I want. This is more typically how metal films are deposited. I can also do chemical vapor deposition, and I'll best describe this in a minute. The, uh, uh, what this means is you uh, form a film on the surface by, a, by doing a chemical reaction at the surface. So I put some chemical ingredients in the gas phase at high temperature, and they react and deposit the film that I want on the surface. Uh, and for each of these, there's like different types of equipment that are used. You can have chambers that hold like one wafer and maybe in the video you saw the robots that kind of look like they're taking the wafers like pizzas in and out of the oven. That can work. Or in some cases you might have uh, 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 furnaces that hold racks of wafers kind of like dishes in your dishwasher. Uh, and you would load the wafers in on these, these, these racks and the equipment is designed such that the gas flow can be very, very uniform between the wafers. This is how uh, oxide is grown via that you know, chemical reaction under exposure to oxygen. Uh, and uh, all of the gases used are, have to be very, very high purity. So you know, if you see around campus like a, you know, someone delivering gases from a company called Air Gas, or you see like Lindy Gas, another big company. Uh, those are the companies that specialize in making high purity gases. Basically means you buy a tank of gas that has, you know, uh, 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 only that gas molecule in it. It's very, very highly pure and also doesn't have any dust particles in it. Because if you have dust particles, even like nanometer sized dust particles in your gas bottle, then you're going to get those dust particles embedded in the film and it's going to make certain transistors uh, not perform well. So all of this needs to be very, very high purity. So in an example of chemical vapor deposition, you perform a chemical reaction at the substrate to uh, create a thin film by the reaction of different precursors I put in the gas phase. So imagine I have this furnace that contains my rack of wafers and I heat it all up and I insert a couple of gases that I know are going to react uh, at the surface to grow a film. I can choose those gases uh, to deposit dielectric semiconductors and even some metals. Uh, and one uh, very classic example, just like 
growing oxide by converting the surface to oxygen. I can also deposit oxide by a chemical reaction where my substrate remains silicon, but by reaction in the gas phase and on the substrate I form a, an oxide film. So in the first uh, step of the example where we say we take our wafer and we want to put oxide, we could grow the oxide by reaction or we could deposit the oxide by CVD. And this is a classic chemistry process where I think we can follow the chemical equation here. I basically at high temperature, say 350 to 500 C, introduce a mixture of silane, SiH4, silicon attached to hydrogen, and oxygen. And if these molecules uh, interact at the wafer surface at high temperature, they will react to form SiO2, basically uh, uh, modeled by this being the silicon atom and these being the oxygen atoms, and hydrogen. And hydrogen is the reaction product. So not everything reacts, but you get enough reaction such that if I have a uniform temperature and uniform gas, well, I can form this very, very thin film. And there are other examples, like if I want to form not silicon dioxide, but say I want to form titanium nitride, a very hard uh, metal-based coating that might be used on a milling tool to, to make it hard and low friction. I might have, seriously, a gas that contains uh, you know, titanium bonded to some other molecule, and then uh, ammonia, a nitrogen-containing gas. And if I react those under the right way, I can create this film of titanium nitride. So you don't need to know these reactions, but just appreciate that this kind of chemistry can be used to deposit thin films on surfaces. And when you look at, you know, uh, uh, a wafer that has, uh, you know, thin films on it, this is without any patterning, right? The name of the game is precision. This is 250 nanometers or so, this is 50 nanometers, these are relatively thick films, the films should be very, very thin and uniform. If I take a cross-section uh, of, of, of glass, of any window glass, right, window glass or display glass has a bunch of thin films on it because, uh, you know, to have a window be more energy efficient, the idea is we'll be, we, we see outside but the infrared light from the sun uh, doesn't get in and the UV rays don't get in. So they do that by putting a whole bunch of thin films on the glass by this technique over very, very large areas to, to control the optical spectrum. The same techniques are, are used for that. And there are many uh, uh, important uh, process parameters for CVD. You know, uh, I, I, uh, uh, I don't need to tell you like a sort of laundry list, right? You can guess. Temperature, pressure, chemistry, purity of the gases, time, and uh, basically people know how to do this uniformly and how quickly it can be done and so on and so forth. If you meet someone uh, who goes to a, 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 a semiconductor manufacturing company, TSMC or Intel or et cetera, et cetera, uh, Texas Instruments maybe, and they become a process engineer, what that means is their job is to basically develop understanding from a manufacturing and materials point of view of the conditions, the temperature, the pressure, the chemistry, the equipment design needed to deposit uniform thin films or, et or to etch very, very fine features or to do polishing. And there are many, uh, uh, you know, manufacturing focused jobs that emphasize doing that, uh, uh, doing that well uh, in the industry. So, you know, say I use the, 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 the thin film deposition processes to deposit my SiO2 and to deposit my metal. Now I want to talk about patterning the materials. How do I do the lithography? So first I want to coat a layer of photoresist. Uh, and we can think of the photoresist as being like, you know, essentially like stereolithography resin, only a different type of polymer. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, how do you get a thin layer of polymer on a wafer around substrate? Uh, you basically do this. You do what's called spin coating. You take the wafer, you put it on a, on a, on a pedestal, you, you, you rotate it at pretty high speed, turns out a few thousand RPM. You dispense the photoresist onto the surface and you let it spin off, leaving only a thin film behind. And you just wait for a certain amount of time. And basically looks like this. Uh, best diagram I could find is in German. Some of you can read that. We can understand what's, what's going on. Uh, here's the wafer. Here's, a, here's, here's it spinning. This is a dispenser. 
Uh, and basically what happens is I start out spinning at low speed, I pull the photoresist in the center, and then once I've dispensed and there's a pool in the center, I spin up at high speed and the uh, uh, photoresist runs off the edges. This is all clean so I can reuse what runs off the edges and fluid mechanics tells me that I will have a film of uniform thickness uh, if I spin fast enough uh, and I can relate the thickness of that film to the parameters of the problem, the time, the speed, the viscosity of the, of the photoresist uh, and uh, basically this is reduced to uh, you know kind of a, a textbook thing where uh, if you buy a photoresist from a company that makes these chemicals, there are companies that their businesses they make photoresists as chemicals, uh, they will tell you uh, basically the program, how much resist you need to dispense, how fast you need to spin versus time uh, and how thick your photoresist layer will be. Uh, and for example, this is a, uh, an example relationship between the thickness of the photoresist here in microns, so here are pretty thick layers actually, uh, versus spin speed in RPM uh, for three different viscosities. So if the resist is more viscous, the layer is going to be thicker because it's going to flow less easily. And if I take any of these uh, resists with a fixed viscosity, as I spin faster, the layer is going to get thinner. Right? So if I want to have very thin layers, I need to spin fast, I need to have a low viscosity resin, et cetera, et cetera. This is all figured out. And these are like the process parameters that would be necessary to control uh, the, the, the step of, uh, of, 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 of photoresist deposition. And so now we have our thin layer of photoresist and we can pattern it, we can do lithog photolithography. And photolithography is basically pattern transfer using this photosensitive polymer. Right? Some of you may have done photolithography in other context, contexts uh, for you know, patterning and etching metal plates uh, and some of you may have done you know, cleanroom processing before. Uh, so basically what we have here is we have our this, is me, this, is, this yellow substrate is meant to be the wafer. This is the material upon which we, which we want to pattern. So this is a different diagram uh, uh, from a textbook, uh, but you get the idea. And then this is the photoresist polymer we just coated. What we do is we take that substrate with the polymer that hasn't been exposed to light yet, is only exposed to like light that doesn't uh, react with the polymer, and we expose it to typically uh, concentrated ultraviolet light uh, and we expose it through what's called a photo mask which is basically a glass plate that allows light only in certain areas and we pattern that mask to represent the image that we want to pattern in our material right so if it's a bunch of lines that we want to pattern I have a glass plate with basically a bunch of lines uh, 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 see-through and a bunch of lines blocked uh, and for example here in areas where the light passes through my mask and, uh, and hits the photoresist, I cross-link it. Just like when you do 3D printing, you cross-link where the laser hits. And in other areas where it hasn't received light, it's not cross-linked. So I can then take this and I can put it into a solvent that dissolves the uncured, uncross-linked photoresist and I can clean up those areas. So basically now I've used light to cure the photoresist and I've used uh, a solvent to remove the uncured areas and then what I do is I take this, dry it off and I put it in another machine that will expose to a gas or a liquid that will etch my material I want to etch and leave features like this and then I strip the photoresist away and I have my final, final pattern. So I said this before in the other diagram, the photolithography process is what we care about here. Uh, and Here's what, if I had brought you the, the glass plate I have, which is roughly the size of this wafer, but it's square. This is one I actually used in my own research many years ago. Uh, it doesn't have very fine features, but shows the idea. You know, it, it would be like this. It has, it's basically a very flat plate of glass with chrome patterned, uh, a reflective uh, metal. And if I put this in a machine that will have a UV lamp and, and, and place it on my wafer, the wafer is only going to receive light in the areas that are obviously transparent. And that's what I'll use to cross-link my photoresist locally. Now, like if I want to do this in a 
MIT clean room where I might be prototyping my you know, special electronic device for my thesis, I'll be able to walk up to the machine and you know, use, wearing the clean room garments and gloves and insert the wafers and insert the masks. But if I'm in you know, the, the semiconductor industry, this is all going to be done by a really big automated machine and I'm going to be making really, really fine features. Right? Uh, I emphasized before that the industry is trying to go to smaller and smaller line widths. I'm going to want to pattern features that are, you know, tens of nanometers across via special optics and very fine wavelength light and so on. And I'm going to have to do that, number one, very quickly. And I'm going to have to do that, number two, uh, with very, very high precision. Right? Because I need to align, just align the wafers and align the patterns very accurately. Yes. So basically, lithography using a beam. So I take the, I, I take the, the plate with, uh, with, with, with uh, I take a glass plate, I put metal on it everywhere, I put photoresist on it, and I basically use a very high resolution equivalent of a scanning laser, like in an SLA process, to cure that resist locally, and then I can do lithography on it. Or I could, in some cases, uh, actually uh, 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 blast the metal away locally using an electron beam. That's how production masks are made for, for, for fine semiconductor processing. They're made using what's called electron beam writing. Good question. Anything else? All right. So uh, I, I, I say that uh, fast and precise to say what you need is one of these. This is called a wafer stepper. Uh, uh, what uh, it is is it's a very, very uh, fancy, high precision uh, exposure machine that is solely dedicated to the step of taking those wafers coated with photoresist and projecting patterns of light on them through photo masks. And this says ASML, representing a big company based in uh, uh, the Netherlands that is probably best in the world at making this precision equipment for, uh, for wafer patterning. This machine would be like the size of the front of this room or something and probably cost $50 million. Uh, it can move back and forth at meters per second. Uh, and it has very, very specialized high intensity UV light sources uh, that uh, create uh, light that is very, very fine wavelength, like almost as fine as, as x-rays because the feature size, the smallest feature size you can expose is limited by the wavelength of light that you use. Kind of a, a physics thing, but a limitation to this process. And what you see in here is kind of a cutaway of all the mechatronics needed to move the wafers and align them and stack them. And all of this is automated and all of this is in vacuum because they don't want any gas in there because they don't want any dust or interference by the, uh, the gas flows. Uh, and I have a, a short video uh, to show you to, dis to describe uh, this, hopefully complement what I said, and uh, here we go. In huge amounts of data. By making transistors smaller, uh, chips are cheaper to manufacture, which is important. This is ASML. And smaller transistors are also faster. <laughs> In factory, which is important. And smaller transistors are also faster, which render the chips more powerful. A technology that enables that is called lithography. Higher resolution is important to make smaller transistors. We achieve higher resolutions by developing more advanced mechatronic systems, more advanced lens systems, and software. However, making smaller transistors is not the only important aspect of this business. When we make chips, what we're really doing is making three-dimensional constructions. We start at the bottom layer of tiny transistors, and then we add more layers, interconnecting those transistors with an intricate maze of wires. So we saw this bending before, but what I'll emphasize here is that you need the sense signal in plane and out of plane. And the plane, you need very good alignment between the subsequent layers because one of your layers is probably going to be the vertical bit that goes between this planar layer and that planar layer, like signals in plane and signals vertical. And if these features are, you know, 10, 20 nanometers wide, my alignment needs to be, you know, say it, say a tenth of that. It's like the floors of a high-rise building. Each floor must fit exactly on top of the previous one 
with pipes running vertically through the building. The accuracy with which these layers are aligned and placed on top of one another uh, is called overlay in the industry. And overlay is very important because it determines whether a ship works or not. Uh, these days we already have the ship overlay in the order of only a few nanometers. That's not all. Affordable ships also need to rely on very economical and efficient machines to produce them. If we can make machines faster, they become more productive and cost-effective. Every chip needs to be imaged individually. We can't image the full silicon wafer in one fell swoop. We need to step to each chip, then scan, one by one. The scanning process takes time, and as we try to make transistors even smaller, we will need to image critical layers twice instead of once, which will take even more time. That's a process called double passing. So lithography machines need to be faster and more accurate in their positioning because the smallest features put on the wafer are getting smaller and smaller. Several years ago, we recognized that to enable double passing, chip makers would need faster and more accurate machines. We needed a new platform. The engineers at ASML came up with an elegant new design. Okay. Okay. So I said, I said a moment ago, for stepper. Basically what stepper refers to is the fact that you have many identical devices on the wafer and the machine will project an image and then step over to the next space and project the next image and so on and so forth. So it actually takes a, 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 a mask that has basically the image of one of the small areas, one of the die as they're called, and, 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 and demagnifies the image down to higher resolution and projects that locally and then moves over. And it needs to do this very accurately, like aligned with the layer underneath it and also very quickly because it needs to have a high productivity to be able to you know, pr uh, be, uh, be as, uh, as cost effective as possible. What remained was the popular concept of twin wafer stages, one measuring the wafer while the other is being exposed. What's new are lighter stages that can move much more freely and accelerate faster through the machine, increasing productivity significantly. Also, a fundamentally new measurement system makes it possible to accurately position the wafer within a few nanometers. More precision means better overlay, which will result in more good chips per wafer. And what that means is, of course, more dollars per wafer. This is the step we needed to keep Moore's law going, not only enabling uh, the manufacturing of smaller transistors, but also helping chip makers to achieve new, in other words, good chips per wafer and reducing their manufacturing costs. Some of you probably know Professor David Trumper. He does research in this area of like high performance mechatronics and motion stages and has done a lot of work with ASML and helped them advance the machine uh, technology to do this high speed, very accurate positioning for, for wafer steppers. Uh, and uh, if you look at you know, what limits the size of the uh, devices you can make, uh, I said a moment ago, you, f you find that the size of you know, the smallest feature you can project is not only determined by how wide your feature in your mask is, but also what is the wavelength of light that you're projecting through the mask. What I mean here is basically if you have a feature smaller than the wavelength of light, you can't effectively image that feature. Uh, so uh, the optics inside these machines, as well as the choice of very fine wavelength light sources is done to be able to uh, enable the exposure and patterning of smaller and smaller features. features. Uh, and like one of the tricks that they do is what's called liquid immersion. Basically what it means is inside the machine, uh, the lens that projects the light source is actually uh, 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 immersed in a thin film of water between the substrate, the wafer with the photoresist, and the optics. And uh, water has a higher refractive index than air, so the rays of light will bend more when they uh, go across the interface between the lens and the water. And this basically lets the light be focused to a finer and finer spot. And like, you know, air has a refractive index of one relative to that water is 1.44. So this is like a few tens of percent. And that's a big deal, even if you're going, you know, uh, from, you know, 20 nanometers to 17 nanometers or 40 nanometers to 35 nanometers. It only is a few percent, right? Uh, uh, the numbers I'm giving, but if I say that's a linear dimension, I square it. If I'm 10 or 20% smaller, then I can have 
10 or 20 percent more transistors on the wafer. I can get 10 or 20 percent more out of the wafer. And also, if the transistors are smaller uh, and I have all my dimensions right, I'll consume less power and I can, you know, make the, you know, in some way the battery of the device, what power is needed, last longer. And, and that's how even these seemingly small increments make a big difference. So we're not making like, you know, 10x improvements uh, over you know one year, but we're making you know 10 percent, 20 percent a year still, and, and and advancing the you know the finest features and the performance of the related devices. So uh, the last thing we need to do is etch, basically take the top picture we have now and expose it to a gas or a liquid to etch away the red areas between the photoresist. Uh, and there's basically two types of etching, dry etching or wet etching. Uh, dry etching means I etch using a gas and wet etching means I etch using a liquid. Uh, uh, and I can also, you know, within those processes, I can have what's called an isotropic etch or an anisotropic etch. Uh, what that means is how directional is my etching process? So, you know, for example, if this is representing the space between two of my, you know, photoresist features on the metal line, if I have an isotropic etch that etches in all directions, I'm not only going to etch downward, but I'm going to etch to the side, right? So actually the feature I etch is going to be bigger than the, than the hole that I start with. If I have an etching process that's anisotropic, that is somehow directional and only goes down, like as if I were virtually machining it, then I can have a feature that's etched that is closer to the uh, uh, mask that I provide uh, via the photoresist. So here's an example you know, of uh, uh, a typical wet etching setup. Again, a small manual clean room where I'm dipping wafers. That's not me, but someone would be dipping wafers inside, inside the liquid. And, uh, you know, if this, is the, if this is a hole I have in my, my masking layer or my photoresist and I dip it in a liquid that etches the wafer underneath and etches in all directions, basically you can see over time I basically hollow out spherical cavity underneath. Right? So if I have an isotropic etching process, I need to you know, uh, uh, pay attention to this undercut because that affects the final feature dimension that I have. Uh, typically wet etches because you know, liquid, uh, unless there's some particular you know, direction dependent reaction, etching reaction, uh, wet etches are isotropic. Uh, they'll etch in any direction that they, that they can go. Uh, there are some dry etches with gases that are highly selective because you can accelerate the gas and you can also uh, switch different gases in particular ways that allow me to etch very, very deep and straight. So here's an example of an anisotropic etch basically where uh, I start with, right, this is the full wafer and I have patterns of my mask layer on top and I expose it to a gas mixture that etches down only vertically and therefore I can etch these very, very, very straight trenches. Uh, uh, this is not perfect. If you see here, this has a little bit of side etching. So this is the, uh, the starting mask feature and I've etched down all this way and I've etched to the side a little bit. Uh, and also something I have to pay attention to when I etch is what's called etch selectivity. Basically, the premise here is I choose something that will etch what I want to etch and not etch what, uh, what my mask is. But typically, there will be some finite etch rate of my masking layer. So if the selectivity is high, basically I etch a lot of this and none of this. Uh, uh, you know, it remains like this. If the selectivity is low, then I etch some of this and some of this. And that's okay as long as uh, you know, I don't need to etch deep enough such that I completely consume my mask. If that is the case, right, if this is gone and I'm still etching downward, then I'm going to start etching from the top as well and game over. So those are, you know, example process parameters like the anisotropy, the selectivity for etching processes. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, putting these all together, I think we can, you know, realize the, you know, endpoint of the example uh, that I laid out. Uh, which uh, is 
the realization of something simple like this, right? Simple lines on a substrate, but involving multiple materials and deposition and etching steps. And uh, I won't ask you this question because I want to keep moving, but we can appreciate some of the parameters that are important for quality fabrication of each layer and the fact that you stack up many layers to make, you know, uh, even what's considered uh, a basic electronic device. So in maybe 10, 15 minutes, we'll take a short break to give you a breather. I want to talk about one more extrapolation of semiconductor manufacturing, and that is to uh, microelectromechanical devices. So does, who knows what a MEMS device is, a microelectromechanical device? Tell us. Sure, sure. So yeah, good, good answer. Basically, what 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 microelectromechanical systems or MEM stands for is uh, devices made using these kinds of technologies, but uh, they not only contain electrical parts, but they contain mechanical parts. Mechanical parts that can execute simple motions. Right? For instance, uh, one of the first micromechanical devices is. Uh, 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 a microelectromechanical device is an accelerometer, right? You know, now all of, you know, phones and other things have uh, inertial sensors, right? How does your phone tell w when you rotate it or how fast you're walking? It's because there are small devices, uh, accelerometers and gyroscopes made using similar technology as we use for electronic circuits that basically can feel motion and forces. Uh, for example, a, uh, a small plate of material suspended uh, that uh, can move a little bit when you start walking or when you rotate your phone and find circuitry around it that can detect that motion by, say, detecting the motion of that mass, changing a small gap, and therefore changing a capacitance. So that's kind of an abstract description, but I want to emphasize to you that these techniques can also be used to make, you know, some kinds of very important mechanical devices. Right now, uh, you know, accelerometers and uh, gyroscopes uh, are widespread in, in, in handheld devices and so on. Uh, you know, before that they were restricted to specialized applications and the first thing they got into was uh, airbag deployment in cars, right? When cars uh, started having airbags, probably, you know, uh, 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 you know, in every car about the time you all were born, uh, it was not just because airbags were, you know, invented, it was because we developed sensors that could detect precise decelerations and changes in motion direction of vehicles, enabling the airbags to be robustly deployed. And that's how airbags are deployed, uh, you know, if a, if a car is in, a, in an incident. Another type of MEMS device I want to tell you about is basically a projector. Who's heard of a, of a, of a DLP uh, display or seen on a projector an, an acronym that says DLP? Well, you know, at Ohio State University in 1895, the first you know, light projector, electrical lantern projector was used. Now, if I look inside a projector, uh, I see something like this. Uh, what is this? This is what we call a, 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 a digital light processor or, or, a, a, or a digital mirror display. And this is a device invented by Texas Instruments. You know, what's that, 30 years ago? Uh, and shipped 10 years later, uh, which is basically how projectors create images. Uh, they create images digitally by, uh, you know, I, I still think this is kind of, kind of wild and amazing, uh, by taking uh, uh, a light source, basically LEDs, and shining them off an array of very, very small mirrors. And basically what this means is when we look at this image, each pixel of the image, right, basically the smallest uh, piece of data that can be projected is light reflecting off one small mirror inside the projector. Mirrors that are 5 by 5 microns on a side, like many could fit in the cross section of your hair. And what I mean is if I say I want to project a simple black and white image, say there are no colors, right? Uh, in the areas that are black, the light that is reflecting off 
mirrors in those places is being sent elsewhere inside the projector and where I have white light the light is being reflected off the mirrors onto the screen and every time I change the slide the mirrors in the display are changing their orientation such that they send you know light uh, toward the, the, sc the screen and light elsewhere and now it, 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 it creates colors by having multiple colors of light and though that that uh, that reflect off mirrors at frequencies that are faster than our eyes can observe but create this color image and the same thing happens if you're watching a video and this technology like revolutionized uh, digital projection in classrooms and conference rooms and also the high end of it uh, having extremely bright, extremely high resolution projectors with many, many, many mirrors like thousands upon thousands of mirrors on a side also uh, basically, you know, uh, for, for all, uh, 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 you know, mainstream purposes kicked uh, uh, regular film out of movie projectors. So most every movie theater is driven by high-end uh, Texas Instruments chips. Uh, and uh, why I say this a bit more is if I cut a cross section of one of these mirrors, it looks like this. So if I open up the projector and I find the piece of silicon wafer that contains all the mirrors that pivot to move the light you know, uh, toward the screen and away from the screen, I find that each of those mirrors is a very, very shiny reflective piece of, of, of metal film that's basically supported on a whole bunch of very, very tiny springs that are actuated by applying a voltage un underneath such that the mirrors can tip and tilt uh, in and out of view. Uh, and uh, I won't explain the details of this mechanism, but basically, you know, it's, it's kind of like if you're standing on a skateboard and you're tilting back and forth, right? Imagine each of those mirrors being tilted back and forth by, you know, not having someone stand on them and tilt them back and forth, but by having a voltage applied underneath that attracts uh, them against the spring force and tilts them from side to side. Uh, and this is a picture from uh, a, a previous generation of the device, which is larger than, than the devices are now. But in this case, these hinges, or like the suspension springs, are uh, you know, 600 by 60 nanometers. 60 nanometers thick, 600 nanometers wide, and a few microns long. Uh, and uh, the way they control the thin film process, uh, it basically allows these to be single crystal and we talked a little bit about turbine blades being single crystal for aircraft engines and giving very, very high fatigue life. If I imagine I have a projector, right? You know, the lamp burns out, but the, but, the, but, the, but the display does not burn out. If I want to use this to, you know, work for 10 years uh, in a classroom or project movies for several years, these little hinges need to basically have infinite fatigue life. And so they can tilt back and forth by several degrees many, many, many times over and over. And this is a great example of what we call a microelectromechanical device made using uh, same kinds of technology that we can appreciate can be done by thin film deposition and etching. One of the differences here is that we have a lot of suspended structures, so things are not really embedded in one solid matrix, but the structures are suspended. That leads to some additional considerations in the processing and also the, the materials are under mechanical stress so we have to know you know that they will bend without breaking and and respond in uh, particular ways whereas in you know electronic devices were considered about electrical transport uh, and you know this is uh, such an influential technology to the movie industry uh, for example this guy who was the lead inventor Dr. Larry Hornbeck in 2015 got uh, the, the Academy Award for you know, contribution to, uh, uh, to motion picture technology. Which I, and that's him holding the DLP chip that goes inside a cinema projector, a projector you would find in a movie theater you, uh, you might go to. Uh, and I just think that's pretty cool that after so many years, right, the, uh, the scientist, the engineer gets the prize for such an important contribution. Uh, and here is what I described before, the idea of an accelerometer. Right? If you take courses on microfabrication or MEMS devices, which you can at MIT, you'll learn about the classic design of accelerometers. Uh, basically, uh, uh, in the plane of the wafer, uh, I create a suspended thin film 
basically as a moving mass, right? In dynamics classes, you talk about mass spring systems. Here, think of the same thing, only the mass and the spring are very, very small, but uh, even though they're small, if I move the ground, they will still move. And if I can measure the deflection upon motion, I can back out the acceleration. Uh, and basically, this is how simple MEMS accelerometers work, is they have a mass that's attached by small springs, all made by photolithography, to the wafer. And they have other pieces of the, of the film that are fixed in our sensors. And if you basically measure the change in capacitance between this finger attached to the mass and these stationary fingers, and do the data process you can uh, sense motion. And now, uh, uh, because the market for things is so big, you have multiple axes of accelerometers that measure different directions and different orientations, and also different designs that actually measure rotation. And that's what costs uh, you know, a few dollars or less uh, to put in a, in a phone or a gaming device or uh, you know, a, a, a drone for navigation and, and many, many other things. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, simple displays. So in you know something like a tablet, we see similar processes, planar, thin film deposition, etching, applied to obviously a wide variety of materials in it, like different length scales, very, very fine lines in transistors and bigger dimensions for other purposes. And we get that contrast of bigger dimensions if we uh, uh, look at the display of the tablet. So you know, the display is what basically takes light and turns the light into an image that you can see and watch and read. Uh, and there are different kinds of display technologies. You might have heard of LCD displays and LED displays and organic LEDs and so on and so forth, uh, uh, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. Uh, an inexpensive device such as this one uses the simplest display, which is a LCD display, and that stands for liquid crystal. What liquid crystal display means is basically uh, when the display uh, is on, uh, it is attempting to send light through the display everywhere over all the pixels, but between the light source at the back, which is called the backlight, uh, and what you see with your eyes, there uh, are two key elements. The first element uh, is an array of liquid crystal pixels, that's what the LCD stands for, that basically can be switched with voltage to be transparent or opaque, that let light through in particular locations or not. And then above those pixels, a color filter, which is basically a static film with small dots of the primary colors of forming this basic image, red, green, and blue, such that when light is let through, red, blue, and, green, and or green pixels in the small locations uh, across the whole display, an image that you know, is fairly detailed and rich in color is formed and, and witnessed by our eyes. Uh, and you know, this is, a, I haven't taken a part, but there's glass on top and there's many you know, uh, sort of film sheets, stacks uh, uh, behind it. This itself is an assembly. Uh, and uh, the color filter, for example, is made basically using photolithography, where each of these materials is essentially a color photoresist, a color photopolymer. And if I cut you know, the device apart, as I said before, now I'm showing a wider view, where here's the circuit board. That's the board. That's the processor. That's the components, capacitors, and resistors. Here's a piece of the plastic case, the middle case. And then here's the display. You can see the layers of the display being stacked up. Uh, and what we ask you to combine uh, what we talked about you know, uh, uh, before the break with the idea of how this display works to do in the first problem of the assignment is basically talk about how you think the little transistors, the thin film transistors that are used to switch the 
transmission of the liquid crystal, uh, 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 how those are made. And then we ask you some questions about dimensions and just to make sure it's, 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 it's all clear, right? When we say the display has a resolution of, you know, a certain number of pixels, n pixels by m pixels, that means that one pixel contains one red, one green, one blue, right? So I say here, this is a pixel. If it's 1,024 by 768, there are 1024 times 768 pixels, each of which contains a red, a green, and a blue, or maybe vice versa if I printed it in color, doesn't matter. And then within each pixel, there's a little transistor in the corner that is able to apply a voltage across a liquid crystal film, i.e. be switched to control whether or not light will come from the back and pass through the color filter or not. And if I block the light behind, you know, the, uh, the say the red, the red subpixel here, I'm not going to see red in that little area of the display. And if I do this in a programmed fashion, right, all over the display, I can display images and I can play video. Uh, so what we're asking you in the first question is a matter of how you would design a process to, you know, uh, to look up how you would deposit, you know, these different materials and etch the different materials. So you'll have a process flow. And the second part is is really, you know, simply some some math on dimensions according to resolution and and you know how do the dimensions needed for this compare to what would be the the state of the art if you wanted to make the finest features possible. And uh, uh, you know, for instance, the color filter, we're not asking you how to make the color filter, we're asking you to make the transistors, uh, but uh, for instance, this color filter, which is basically the sheet of plastic with color dots on it that, 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 that allows projection of the different primary colors, is basically made by a three-step photolithography process or a three-cycle photolithography process where each cycle processes a different color of resist. So red photoresist, green photoresist, blue photoresist uh, that creates these dots of different color colors in an array where you have red and green and blue all next to each other with black matrix in between, probably containing carbon black, and that's how the color filter is made. So even this, you could say, low resolution color filter, which uh, might have you know, dimensions of many, many microns per pixel, not in the nanometer range, is made using uh, photolithography because that's how you're able to uh, pattern small pieces of material, of polymer material, different materials uh, with uniformity and, 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 and this micro scale confinement. Uh, and another interesting application of the same kinds of lithography techniques is uh, how the touch screen works. So all our devices have touch screens. You know, basically uh, you may know that uh, a touch screen operates by measuring uh, changes in capacitance between electrodes as your finger moves across the device, right? So you're not, you're not electrically contacting the, 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 the device, but basically you are communicating uh, through the glass to uh, patterned electrodes made out of a transparent conducting material, typically a material uh, that's uh, indium tin oxide, and changing the local capacitance between these electrodes that are patterned on the glass. So one of the most important materials in making touchscreen displays is this ITO, this indium tin oxide, which basically lets the display manufacturers form patterns of electrodes that are transparent. You can see the image through them, uh, but are conducting and can therefore measure the change in capacitance as your finger runs over the display. And doing this, you know, not with nanometer resolution, but with finer and finer resolution, with more tricks for signal processing, is what enables, you know, for example, uh, you know, uh, stylite to write on screens or advanced multi-touch features. Right, you can have multiple fingers on the screen and do gestures, and it's all about using capacitance and other tricks to measure virtually the position of your finger across the surface. And if I have basically plastic films and glass sheets that stack up to make the display glass, I have to do, you know, lithography on the ITO film to be able to pattern the uh, material for the electrodes in the capacitive touch display. Uh, and when the glass for displays is made, 
Uh, it's not made like in wafers, but it's made in very, very large sheets, basically sheets that are like the size of big windows, maybe a four by eight sheets. And then it's uh, patterned with very, very large machines that project light uh, uh, you know, in, in patches to do the photolithography and put through uh, thin film deposition equipment such as you know, PVD or sputtering for metals on very, very large areas and then it's automatically cut up into the size of displays that's you know, used in phones and tablets. Uh, and even if you like you know, buy a flat screen TV in the, uh, in, the, in the TV manufacturing plant they don't make like TVs, you know, individually uh, at the display level, but they make, you know, many screens in one big piece and then they cut them up after they do all the, uh, all the patterning of the materials on the display and then they assemble them into the housing with all the circuit boards and so on and so forth. So there's kind of this other scale of manufacturing uh, and, uh, you know, for instance, I just show this, which is an example of a, a, a schematic of a, of a thin film deposition line for depositing many thin film coatings on glass, right? Maybe the ITO, maybe other coatings that are needed, not only for these transparent conductors, but also to manipulate the reflectivity of the glass or used for windows. Uh, and basically, uh, you find these big machines that'll take a plate of glass where like, you know, imagine one tablet display would be a small piece of the sheet of glass and basically send it inside these uh, vacuum chambers that will pump down and transfer and deposit different films one after the other and then if you wanted to pattern a stack of films and then pattern them all together you could do the lithography at the end of this process. Or if I'm just manufacturing windows, uh, I don't need like electrodes on the windows, I can just have many thin film stacks to do the you know, light transmission and heat blocking I was describing earlier and the same kind of technology shown here is used for that. And uh, to close the loop on the example, even uh, uh, what uh, uh, I've said a couple times, right, razor blades, example from the quiz, same schematic as the quiz, use the same kind of thin film deposition technology, uh, chemical and physical vapor deposition to take the base blade, which is steel, very, very finely ground, machined, honed steel, and then deposit multiple coatings to keep it uh, hard and in the final case the outer coating is actually a layer of basically Teflon which is uh, uh, all, you know, water resistant and low friction so it can maintain its sharpness and also slide smoothly across your skin if you're shaving. And uh, they've basically taken the understanding of thin film deposition from the semiconductor industry and applied it to uh, making you know, razor blades uh, retain their sharpness and uh, be more comfortable to use. Okay, <clears throat> so, you know, f formally uh, the story has three parts and this is the beginning of the third part where, you know, the first part was uh, uh, more about semiconductor industry, thin film deposition, microprocessors. The second part was about these other, uh, you know, uh, uh, types of things, MEMS devices, accelerometers, projectors, displays. And the third part is now about circuit board manufacturing and assembly. So now what we've done is we've made like all the stuff on wafers and done all the lithography. Now how do we put it all together into a circuit board? And then uh, you know uh, uh, probably for you to, to uh, you know uh, if you're interested read more about on your own how do I actually make the little surface mount devices resistors and capacitors that are the smaller components on circuit boards. We'll tell you how to assemble them which is what's more so for the assignment but it's interesting to see how these are how these are made because it's impressive how they're made you know, they're, 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 they're basically uh, free they're far less than one cent each and they have to be made in mass numbers. Uh, but, you know, basically what we want to think about is if I have, you know, a uh, printed circuit board, which is basically the substrate here, uh, how do I make that? And then how do I uh, assemble and anchor all the components that I want to put uh, down? Uh, and you know, I might have some things with our multiple circuit board assemblies, right? So this clearly has, this light bulb clearly has two boards uh, that are 
processed separately in plain and then kind of stuck together like a, like a wiffle tree type thing. Or, you know, the example from the assignment, uh, the bulb here is, you know, maybe a little bit simpler design, fewer, fewer components, because uh, this one is dimmable, this one isn't dimmable. You need more power electronics to be able to dim it. Uh, but, you know, same idea, here you have, uh, you know, one circuit board with the LEDs on the top and some other components, and then you have the other board, which is orthogonal to it, with other components that are soldered to it. You know, some on the surface, and then this big capacitor back here, uh, which actually is, is so big that it has, uh, you know, uh, through-hole connections, what are called pin and hole connections, that are, that are soldered from the back. <coughs> So we'll talk a bit about circuit board manufacturing, circuit board assembly, including solder reflow, pick and place technologies beyond what are used in circuit boards. And then I'll close with an interesting example about three-dimensional circuit, circuits on curved surfaces. So when I look at, and I'm jumping around a little bit here, uh, when I look at a circuit board, right, what I mean by the circuit board is the substrate that holds all the, all the chips. So back to this picture, this is basically the, you know, the green or tan substrate right here. And, you know, if, if, I, if I look at it, you know, closely, I see, you know, traces, right? Uh, these are basically lines patterned onto the circuit board that are going to send specific signals from one component to another component. Uh, and kind of like a, you know, silicon device that has many, many layers, right? I can imagine if I have many components, right, on a circuit board and I need them all to talk to one another, right? It's not good enough just to have, you know, one layer of connections, right? It's like when highways intersect, right? You can't have the highways intersect in the same plane. They have to have interchanges. So just like for the, the silicon wafer device, circuit boards are typically multi-layer. And uh, this cross-section shows, you know, a bit coarsely because 